Why aren't you listening to me? Doesn't anybody ever listen to me? Listen to me? Listen to me? Listen to me? Blame yourselves for this fucking word salad that I just spit all over the goddamn plate. This is all your fault. You and I like to. That's it. I like to. I work under the cover of darkness because I don't need the rest of society to look in my eyes and know that is a bad person. Hey, what's happening, Mike Schmidt, 40 year old boy podcast? Folks, I don't know if you know this about Los Angeles. On Tuesdays, all museums are free. That's right. I was just informed by Lily Von Stupp that apparently uh, I should get some culture. And uh, but by all means, don't pay for that culture. Oh, my God. You want culture, pal? That's fine. Every Tuesday, it's for free. But do not pay the other six days, please. Hold your culture till Tuesdays. That's when you should better yourself as a human being. Because it's free. Uh, I, I gotta be honest. I thought all museums were free. Shouldn't they all be free? Shouldn't you just be able to walk? I mean, the whole point is they want you to walk in and look at get culture. They want you to be a, a person who knows about paintings and statues. Fuck that. <laughs> I'm not a sculptist or a painter. <laughs> uh, painter? Why did I put a PA? Why, is, that, is that like a piano thing? A painter. Uh, Harold Painter. His plays are fantastic. Uh, I got culture. See, folks, I got goddamn culture. Uh, I have no culture. All right. Uh, speaking of culture, our culture is failing right now. Everything's going to hell. I showed up here at Lily Von Stipp's house, and we just spent the last hour talking about how the American dream is over and everything has failed. And I can't decide, folks. I need to know. I, I have no idea if that means the American dream is over for uh, for people such as myself and Lily Von Stupp, <laughs> or it's over for society as a whole. Because I mean, I, I tend to feel that it's over for everybody and everything. We're all just marking time. And you know me, I love chaos. So I'm waiting to see what the fuck is going to happen. I have no idea why people haven't armed themselves. Oh, I'm, I'm, look, some of you have armed yourselves. All right. <laughs> I, I, I believe me, if anything ever hits the fan in this country, I'm talking zombie apocalypse, race war, whatever the fuck happens, I can tell you exactly where I'm going. Riverside, California to Eric Butterfield's house. That's where I'm going, friends. <laughs> if you don't know Eric, Eric was the guy who basically told me to start doing this show. And so now I take all of my cues from life from Eric Butterfield. And also Eric is a uh, he's a gun aficionado. And uh, I think aficionado is a far too fancy word to use for people who love guns. <laughs> Shouldn't I just say nut? I should probably say he's a gun nut. But uh, he took me out shooting. You can go ahead and buy year one and you'll hear all about it. But uh, I, I had slide bite, which just healed this week. What, if that, what was that the case? It'd be awful. Hold on. I lost an ear. That's not good. Is it, uh, uh, folks, I apologize. You know the new rig, the new rig set up. Uh, oh, oh, is it, oh, it's going now. All right. There we are. Yeah. Hi. I'm back. You folks, but you folks can hear me fine. Look, again, I, you got to recognize I'm talking to me, all right? I'm, I'm the, the only person listening to me right now is me. So if the ear goes off, I'm just like, oh, shit, the, the ear got faded. Uh, and then I suck all of you people into it. And by all, I mean some. And by some, I mean none. Because there's nobody listening. We all know that. Uh, all right, folks. So, I, uh, yeah, I am heading out to Riverside and hiding behind. I, I will wear a skirt. I'll just, I, seriously, whatever he needs, I'll wear a gingham. Whatever you need from me, Eric, I'll wear a gingham dress and just protect me from whatever the fuck is happening. Like I said, zombie apocalypse, race war, zombie race war. What if that happened? <laughs> I don't know, actually, when I think about it, I hope that's not the case. What I hope, look, that's why we should all hope that the zombies take over there because there's no racism once the zombies show up, right? <laughs> Black or white, everybody's fucking lunch to those people. The zombies don't give a shit. What if, oh, how horrible would that be? Oh my God, how horrible would that be? If the zombies came back and they decided they were only going to eat black people, we'd be like, oh, really? Racist zombies? God damn it. We thought, I thought it would be utopia on earth with the zombies. All I had to do was avoid zombies, but no, I still have to avoid hate. Oh, Jesus Christ, zombies. Don't be picky. Uh, and no, I'm not making a dark meat, white meat joke. I'm not. <laughs> Take that. And, and I, I'm offended that you even thought of it, folks. I'm offended you even brought it up. You should be ashamed of yourselves, goddammit. I'm, I'm happy I only heard that in one ear. Take that. <laughs> you people mewling about with your horrible jokes. Awful. Uh, racist zombies. That would be just terrible. And what would they do? How would they do it? They shamble up and they see, you know, see a black guy and they, they fucking wolf him. Then a white guy just walks by and the zombies are like, hey, thumbs up. Oh, racist zombies. That's that's really that's worse than a zombie war of zombie apocalypse. A racist zombie war. 
Uh, because you would think that would be the one time when all of humanity could get together. Uh, that would just, oh my God, that would make racism even worse. What if zombies came back from the grave and they only ate black guys? How bad would racism be on this planet? <laughs> Every white guy would be like, hey, uh, Ron, why don't you go check the mail? Oh, why does Ron have to check the mail? White guys should go check the mail. Terrible. Leave Ron in the house. Uh, Ron, this mythical black guy I just invented. Uh... As opposed to Jerome, who is, of course, the only black guy in Nebraska, which is from year two. Buy it, folks. You'll hear that. That up to that was one of my, I, I, up till that moment that I said that joke. That might have been my favorite joke I've ever said on this show. <laughs> Buy year two and find it. It's like a racist joke needle in a haystack. It's a Jerome in a haystack. That's what it is. It's a Jerome in a haystack. Uh, we this country needs this country, this world. You know what? I I speak globally now, folks. We do not need racist zombies. And if the zombies do show up and then they're racist, we should that that it, it, I, it should have the other effect. All races should come together and fight against the racist zombies. But you know there'll be lazy like white white supremacists who are like, oh, this is great. No, it's not great. <laughs> the stench of death is in the air. Yeah, but there's no black guys. Oh, fuck you, white supremacists. You're willing to deal with the stench of death as long as there's no black guys. Yes, we are. Oh, awful. Fuck you, Utah. Uh, and I'm not even sure if Utah's all white supremacists. They're not, right? Is it Idaho? Uh, it's Idaho. Uh, Utah's off the hook. Utah's Mormons. They're they're not. They're just them supremacists. They're not even <laughs> like Utah doesn't give a shit about white or black. They're just Utah. Utah's the best. Uh, it's like a high school. Utah's a big high school. <laughs> it is. They all dress the same in those skinny ties, uh, except for the players on the Utah Jazz. Like literally, I just pictured. I've never been. Look, I was in Utah twice in my life. I did a show in uh, in Kanab. I I actually got sick in Kanab, Utah. I told that story on here. Horrible. Uh, and then uh, I did a show somewhere in Utah. Where, where the fuck was I? Or no, maybe we were driving to Montana. Maybe we just had to drive through Utah to Montana. I have no idea. Uh, it's hard to remember, folks. I'm white. I was just white. I, I, it was because the weird thing is when you cross the border into Utah as a white person, there's you actually hear like a heavenly choir sing, and it's like. <laughs> You're astonished by it because it's like, oh, what is this supposed to be my, this is my ancestral homeland? But then you look around and you're like, nope, there's just a heavenly choir on the side of the road. <laughs> They've hired them to try to convince white people to stay. Uh, because that's all Utah is. It's just white people on bikes and the Utah jazz. That's all Utah is. <laughs> Literally. It's just uh, Paul Millsap <laughs> walking through the street and a bunch of white guys on bikes zipping past him. Uh, I picture Utah's, it's got to look like uh, like Vietnam. You ever see on Vietnam when they show traffic and it's just this wor- horrible traffic and everybody's on bikes with like three family members stacked on top of each other's shoulders? My buddy uh, Paul Gilmartin does a great joke about that. Oh, he's hysterical. By the way, Paul Gilmartin has a podcast called Mental Health Tales. I don't know. I'm, I'm making it up. <laughs> Mental Health Tales sounds like he's sitting down with a book and opening it and telling you the stories of the people who are deranged. <laughs> it's like a fireside chat as he talks about the, the past crazy. Today we talk about Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh uh, man, he was crazy, right? I think he was. Yeah, he had his moments. Uh, <laughs> folks, it's all going to hell. We all know that, right? And again, I can't decide if it's just if it's going to hell for everybody in the world, or if it's just going to hell for old people like me. Because I look, I was, I just, I again, you know me, I'm full of mirth, and so <laughs> I see what's happening, and I see it all falling apart, and I'm willing to just kind of smile and go, "Yep, it's all falling apart." And because I, I looked at Karen this week, I literally, I looked her in the face, and I went, "Do you know how lucky we are not to have kids?" And uh, aside from the fact that I can still fuck around and do this kind of stupid shit. <laughs> and she's like, what do you mean? And I said, this world, everything has gone to hell. Like, it's never going to be the same. Everything is completely falling apart. And look, I, I've had this feeling before. Okay, when 9-11 happened, I, was, I would walk around for weeks. I walked around going, it's never going to be the same. Things are never going to be the same. And uh, fuck, everything's the same. <laughs> it, it's worse. It's actually worse. Uh, the only thing is we, we've lost two tall buildings. What a bummer. That's a drag and a bunch of people are still, and, uh, although this year's the 10 year anniversary, I'm sure there's going to be a, uh, a solemn tribute or something, uh, which, uh, I used to do a joke about that when they, uh, all right. I'll, uh, I think I may have even done that on here. Did I tell that joke on here? They, uh, <laughs> because this truly happened the year after 9-11, uh, which was 2002, they had a, you know, a tribute, a solemn thing at the world trade center. And then they had a gathering in the field in Pennsylvania and uh, they had, you know, people at the Pentagon. But at the ga- this is true. At the gathering at the field in Pennsylvania, they had a flyover of the, uh, like a Navy flyover. And I said, yeah, because that's exactly what all those people wanted to hear was a plane flying overhead. <laughs> I'm sure they were sitting there thinking of their loved ones in that burned out circle of a field that still hadn't grown fresh grass in a year. 
But any fresh grass that had grown was being fertilized with their loved ones, and they had to hear planes go overhead in tribute? Uh, yeah, that was a mistake. Probably a mistake to bring it up here as well. Uh, and there was only, I did that, I used to do that joke. And there was one guy, there was, uh, uh, my friend Andrew Thompson, who would tell me, he just, he would go, dude, that's the greatest joke ever. He goes, and he would say to me, even a year later, he'd go, you have to tell that joke. And I'm, I'm like, <laughs> and you know, look, I never wrote any materials. So I was like, yes, of course, I'll drag that out. It's not like I can come up with anything new for Christ's sake. Uh, but it is, it's all, everything is, it's falling apart in America. It's falling apart. And, and the thing is, look, all right, we live in America. It's falling apart here, but relative to other places, I understand it's not falling apart as bad as it could be. I, I just, uh, you could, it could be worse. You could live in Korea and you could be getting your cock measured surreptitiously while you're asleep. <laughs> That's right. Uh, do you see the fucking story this week? Dude, fuck. All right, look, all right, let's talk. <laughs> I hate to do this to you. We're going to talk about cocks for a second, but brace yourselves. Lily's, Lily's thrilled. Uh, apparently, there was a study this week that, that came out, and they said that men who have a uh, their ring finger on their right hand, if it's longer than their index finger, they're likelier to have a bigger cock. Okay? And uh, I you see that headline, and you're like, okay, well, I don't know why you're looking at your hand. What is that going to measure? Uh, we already, believe me, we can see everything you got. It's big. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, I when I because again you read that all right the the headline and it's like uh, you know penis size relative to finger length or whatever and you're like well that's interesting I'll read it then you read the story and first of all I should tell you this my wife has always maintained that by the way everybody's always like big feet big hands and and uh, big ears big nose whatever the fuck everybody's got their own fucking theory but uh, Karen <laughs> Karen has always decided that you could go from wrist to tip of middle finger and uh, and get an idea of what you're looking at. You know, Karen's that's her deal. She's always been like, you know what? It's middle finger. She goes, if you go wrist from middle finger, then you know exactly kind of where you're at. I'm like, all right, that's fine. If that's if that's the way you want to figure it out. Uh, but then they so that I tell Karen this week, I go, hey, your study. Yeah, now I'm going to do the whole show with a clenched fist. By the way, I should say that literally Lily went to grab my right hand and I, I closed it into a fist. So I'm doing this whole show with a clenched fist like I'm Bob Dole. Like, literally, I'm going to have to hold a pen the entire. Ah, I got to hold a pen the entire show. Ah, you're not going to be able to find me out. Uh, so yeah, so I read this story this week and I'm like, Karen, you know what? You're not going to believe this. Someone's got your, your, uh, you know, your theory, but they took it like to a, a different degree. Uh, and then, but then when you read the story, you're horrified by the story. Here's what happened in Korea. Okay. Uh, men would go in for an operation like, uh, to get, uh, op- and when they would go under, when they would be anesthetized, anesthetized, uh, they would measure their cocks. <laughs> And they said right when it would happen, they would go ahead and they would uh, they would take their hand and measure their their fingers, and then they would stretch their cock as long as it would go while they were right when they they said they had to do it right when they would under because they you know whatever I, I don't know if you your cock goes crawls into your body cavity when you're under an anesthetic I got no fucking idea again I'm asleep, uh, but they said they would stretch because they said stretching a flaccid penis will indicate exactly how long it gets when it's when it's erect. And they would measure it, and they, their study showed that men with a longer ring finger than index finger had bigger penises than uh, than other guys. And uh, <laughs> I mean, first of all, <laughs> it's Korea. Uh, I don't know if I need to elaborate on that for you folks. Second of all. Why? Who thought? Who decided this was the plan? Who? Who? What? <laughs> Look, I've I've had surgery before, and now this all this does it doesn't. I don't even give a fuck. You know what? Because according to what they have, then I'm I'm okay. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> according to their well, the way they figure everything out, it's like yeah. See, like I said, it's like as the ring finger is longer than the index finger, you're fine. According to what they said, <laughs> which is which is great, but I, I, if you're look, if you're familiar with the the physiology of the cock, all right. <laughs> I have to think that your cock knows that you're in surgery and he's scared, so he's going to shrink up a little bit. So you're you're losing a couple inches just because your cock is scared of surgery, right? This isn't fair to these guys. It's not fair. It's not fair because they didn't sign a release. It's not fair for a million reasons. And of course, they had to do it in fucking Korea because, again, they're the entire third world country. Fuck all that. That's like an eighth world country. What I I didn't even, let's wait, wait. The most surprising thing of this story when I heard about it was that they knew how to do surgery in Korea. Uh, I, you know, as far as measuring cocks and all that, we've been doing that since the goddamn Stone Age, no matter what country you're in. 
But the fact that they would take the time to actually have, oh my God, these guys know how to actually, they have medicine in Korea? I didn't know that. I didn't think a great and fearless leader allowed them to have medicine. <laughs> Measuring cocks on the operating table. I mean, like, cause in, and how, how deep seated does that get into your fears? Really? <laughs> I mean, surgery is bad enough, but now you got to realize that there's a fucking puppet show with your cock when you fucking fall asleep. Really? I came in to get my gallbladder removed and I turned into fucking cock Lafran and Ollie. Thanks. You gotta be fucking joking. Hands off my cock while you're trying to take out my appendix, you dick. And the best part of the story is the way they described it, because the way they described it, they knew they were doing something wrong. The second a guy would go under the anesthesia, a guy would spring into action. I think they actually used that phrase. He would spring into action and measure the fingers, and they would stretch the cock and, and then, uh, you know, measure that. And then they would laugh for 45 minutes. You know they did. I know, because that again, that brings up every horrible thing, because when you go to sleep, you don't know what the fuck is happening. So now you're going to go under anesthetic, you're going to fucking, you know, all of a sudden they put a pizza on your stomach, they're eating Domino's. Everything fucking goes, you know, Kramer's throwing junior mitts into your balls. I mean, what the fuck? You have got to be shitting me. They stretched my cock out and, and measured it on the goddamn table. And how rudimentary is cock size? Honestly, let's seriously, is that what it all gets to? That is. That is what it all gets to. That's the bottom fucking line is my cock is bigger than your cock. Why? Why? <laughs> College degrees don't fucking matter. Great job. Nice, nice carton. Who cares? How big's your cock? Honestly, and that's what it gets to. And what's wrong with people? Because I see like blind items about celebrities. They're like, oh, his cock is small. Ha ha ha. So what? He's rich. He's a fucking celebrity who's rich. What the fuck do you care? God damn it. It's over. It's over. It's over here. It's over there. See, because you know they've been measuring cocks on operating tables for years here in America. But we had the good sense not to try to tie it to some bullshit medical study. See, in Korea, they do it because they think they're trying to be productive. Over here, they just do it because it's fucking hilarious. The second any one of you, any man who has ever had surgery, the second you went out, don't, uh, please. Are you kidding me? You know that surgical table? You know it turns upside down and then your balls or eyes and your cocks hanging down like an elephant nose. And you know they're taking pictures of it. Every doctor in the world has a scrapbook of fucking cock puppet shows. You know they've got it. How pissed are American doctors at Korea right now? Why the fuck did you unveil the secret? What, to prove some bullshit study about cock size and fingers, you dicks? God damn it. We've been doing this forever. And now, now, people are going to worry about it. I guarantee every time you went under, they fucking turned that table around and boom, you had a little safety Sam right there between your legs. That's right. Anybody who knows what I meant by that, write me and tell me. I should just, fuck it, I should just tell them. No, I'm not going to tell you. You know what, find safety, Sam. When you, when you find it, you'll, you'll laugh. Because when I found it as a freshman in high school, I was uproariously entertained. And for the next year, safety Sam figured into everything that Mike Scott and I would talk about. It was hilarious. Uh, I'm not sure if 45-year-old you will find it hilarious, but 13-year-old me found it fucking hysterical. And honestly, 44-year-old me right now thinks it's a beautiful thing as well. Uh, 43. I'll be 44 soon. Don't want to age myself too quickly. But I don't get it. I don't, you know, well, I, uh, the, everything is predicated on cock size. Everything. The entire society. Everything. They should just, they should just b abolish money. And you just have to flash your cock when you go in to buy milk or whatever. And the, the, the guys with the biggest cocks get the best milk. I mean, because that's all anybody fucking cares about in this society. Because everybody's all worried. They're so worried about it. Is it your cock big enough? Is it not big enough? It's just, dude, let it go. If it is the person you're with happy with it, then you're fine. But no, you have to wonder whether or not they're telling you the truth. Fuck you. That's your hang up. <laughs> go get rich. Then, then you know what? You don't have to worry about how big your cock is at that point. Go get rich. Then it's, you don't have to worry about it. You can just go ahead and fucking be rich. And, uh, and believe me, uh, your big green cock is a lot more important. <laughs> it's like they put in those x-ray machines at the airport where they, and they said the TSA had the pat down, but then they're like, or you can opt into this uh, x-ray machine. And everybody's like, oh, people will be able to see my genitals. <laughs> Who the fuck cares who sees your cock? Everybody in the world sees your cock. The only reason people don't want their cock to be seen is because they're worried that it might not be big enough. Are you really that worried about the size of your cock that it won't impress the fucking $8 an hour schlub at the fucking airport? the fuck do you care if that idiot's like haha your cock is small so fucking what i'm flying to detroit <laughs> you're sitting here you fat bastard 
I don't get it. People are just all fucking upset. And now, dude, fuck TSA. All right, look, I <laughs> I respect you and you have to do your job. That's fine. But just do your fucking job. But now I read that there are going to be more TSA pat downs because I read today that they apparently there's a warning like the, the I don't know if there's a color alert anymore. Who the fuck knows? Oh, no, there's terrorist chatter. <laughs> There's terrorist chatter out there that apparently terrorists or, you know, people, they're having bombs surgically implanted into their bodies so they can't be detected by pat downs and, and security. <laughs> what? How fucking bad do you want to blow a plane up that you stitch a fucking bomb into your nutsack? Honestly, what the fuck do you care? How good are 72 virgins if your balls are blown all over the fucking Atlantic? Fuck. I mean, and I'm getting on a plane this weekend. I don't need this nonsense because they said TSA was going to have more pat downs. What does that mean? What are you feeling for? Do you think they're stitching an actual grenade into their thigh? Are you going to feel like a pineapple shape? <laughs> Sir, what's this? Uh, it's a Roomba that I had Im- embedded into my lower back. No, it isn't. It's a fucking bomb. Tackle this idiot. It's not going to happen that way. It's more shit they made up. They, 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 they heard chatter about it. I think Al-Qaeda, again, because fucking Osama's gone now, they don't know what the fuck to do. So they're just making shit up and trying to see what... what it's like a barium enema where they'll, they'll just say something and then they, they see where it exits and then they see the trail it left. They're chattering to the guys who they think are spies. They're like, yeah, you know what we're thinking about? We're thinking about sewing bombs into our nutsacks. Oh, Really? Well, I need to go make a phone call to my friend Habib. And then, he, you know, he calls the CIA and tells them. Next thing you know, it's on the fucking Today Show. And they kill that dude for leaking that information. <laughs> There's no way they're stitching bombs into their fucking... I don't, dude, it, look, if I get in a line and somebody's balls are ticking, <laughs> I'm tackling the motherfucker, okay? <laughs> and if some guy is willing to go to that length, that he's willing to stitch a bomb into his fucking ball, then I'm dead. I'm fucking dead. I respect that level of commitment. I can't lie to you. If you're willing to go under the knife, and, and especially now, knowing now that when you go under the knife and they put some bomb into you, that they're also measuring your cock at the same time. If you're willing to undergo that sort of humiliation just to blow up my plane, then guess what? I'm fish food. That's one explosion I'm willing to fucking take. Seriously, if you're, if you're going to go that route, I have to do it. I, I, I encourage it. I almost encourage it. Look, I'm getting on, and this is not good news for me. I'll be honest with you. If they think bombs are sewn into people, this isn't good news for fat guys. <laughs> because when you see me walking with my huge fat gut, you know what? You know what? It looks like a carrying case for the round bomb with the wick from the cartoon that says bomb on it. They got to think that I'm the guy, right? I, can, I better not make a hissing noise. If I make a hissing noise, they're going to fucking tackle me and drag me off. Going to x-ray me nine ways and then put me under and try to fucking, you know, cut out my stomach and see what I got in there. And then, of course, measure my cock. <laughs> Because we know that's mandatory. We already figured that out. And you know what the worst part about that is? It's like, you know, it's surgery. You trusted them. Like, because you, you, you're like, you were so scared about surgery. You didn't even think about it. But measuring your cock is something you always thought about at the dentist office. At least, you know, when you were going to go under, you're like, oh, yeah. Because it was just presumed that they were whipping your cock out when you went to sleep at the dentist's office. <laughs> that was always, come on. They're, come on. All dentists are molesters. We get that, right? <laughs> That's why they got into it. They're like, well, I don't want to be a real doctor and have that level of commitment, but I still want to get access to a patient's unconscious naked body. I can deal with plaque. That's what they did. That was the trade-off. Uh, don't write me if you're a dentist. Dentists are angry, furious. Uh, <laughs> but this is bad news, man. I, you know, I, I, And especially this fucking looking for bombs and people that's so... This is bad news for fat guys. Let me tell you that right now. Because I have a huge barrel-shaped gut that looks like the perfect carrying case for one of those cartoon round bowling ball bombs with the wick hanging out of it. I better not, I can't even make a hissing noise when I'm in line because they'll tackle me and cut me open to find the goddamn fucking bomb. Oh, this is awful. This trip to Seattle is going to be awful. I'm getting on a plane this weekend, folks. I have to worry about them now thinking I'm carrying a big bowling ball bomb in my stomach. I'm going to look. I uh, let me alert you right now, TSA, everybody. I'm going to Seattle, and the only bomb on the plane is the bomb in my head. <laughs> and I'm not going to detonate it until I get to the fucking Jewel Box Theater Friday night. Did you know the four year old boy once farted in Sergeant Slaughter's face? You're listening to the four year old boy, and later, Sid Barrett's Sudoku Corner brain teasers from a teased brain. Congratulations to Emily, the only one to get last week's puzzle right. And here's, here's the answers to the bottom, the real, real stumper, the hard one. 
She got it. It's five, eight, a smiley face, two stick figures playing volleyball, and the chemical symbol for boron. Shine on, you crazy math whiz, on the Mike Schmidt Podcasting Network. Clover honey pots and mystic shining feed. As I sit here in my tweakedaudio.com slash 40 earbuds, listening to myself in the heat, it's hot, folks. Uh, it's tank top and shorts hot for Lily. For me, it's just uh, sweaty guy hot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mentioned I'm going to Seattle this weekend. That's uh, Friday, July 8th. That's this coming Friday. That's tomorrow when you hear this. Uh, I still don't have a hotel room. I'll tell you that. That's funny. <laughs> because Priceline is being uh, very uh, disappointing as far as I'm concerned. Because everywhere else I've gone, I Priceline it and... Uh, yeah, I, I can't find a hotel room on Priceline for for what I'm considering to be a reasonable price. And I'm getting into the part where I'm going to have to start offering like real money, which I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I also, I can't just fly to town and then go, you know, what, kill time at a coffee house and, and you know, throw on a flannel shirt and run around. I have no idea how to fit in in your town. But I'm looking forward to it. Uh, even if half the crowd is from Portland and saw me there. This will be a test. Because uh, obviously, you know, I've been playing one show in once in cities, and not getting a lot of repeat uh, customers. <laughs> I'm not the ice cream man. What the fuck am I talking about? Uh, so I'm I'm interested to see how it plays if I'm doing because you know they'll uh, uh, because they've seen my tricks. You know what I mean? I know that sounds stupid to say, but they've seen what I do, and so I think if they see it a second time, they're gonna be like, oh. Oh, that oh, we we thought that was unique to that particular performance, and it's like, uh, well, no, I mean, I kind of have to, you know, I tell the same stories, but I I might tell them differently a little bit. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. As now, I warn everybody not to come to the show. <laughs> An idiot. Uh, so that, yeah, this is a show you should only see once. <laughs> oh my God, you don't want to see it twice. So in my in my head, I'm like all freaked out about it because I'm like, should I throw in different stories? Should I make the show different? Should I change it? Uh, eventually, as it takes shape, I can and will, but right now I can't because I'm not doing it enough to change stories. That's the thing. It's like, you know, and I'll tell you this too. It, uh, I found out there's a show after me in Seattle. I didn't, re- I didn't realize that. There's a show at, my show's at 7.30 in Seattle. There's a show at 10. So, uh, so I, I'm probably going to have a lot less room to fuck around in Seattle. <laughs> Uh, which I didn't realize, but that's fine. Uh, or maybe I just go the other route. Maybe I just keep talking. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I've got a band accompanying me. That'll be fantastic. <laughs> that's great. Actually, that works out pretty good. <laughs> I would love to have my story set to music. Uh, i got to find out what kind of music they play to tailor my story accordingly. <laughs> if it's a metal band, I'll tell like a mean story, but it's like a country band, I'll tell some wistful story of America. Uh, I don't have any of those. <laughs> I don't have any American stories or wistful stories, quite frankly. Uh, yeah, so that'll be uh, it'll be fun there. Sure, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. It's, I'm I'm worried about it. I'm worried all the time. I'm an idiot. What do you What do you want? That's what I do. I get worried. Um, you know what I'm going to do? Actually, for this particular show, I'm going to bring tweakedaudio.com/slash forty earbuds and an i iP- and my iPod and just and I will listen to my iPod during my show. And I will just, I will kind of autopilot it and try to see if I can figure out a way to do that. I, I, see, of course, that's because I always say that like laughs uh, make the show better or different or certainly make me go in different directions. But uh, that might not be the case. Maybe if I just wear the, maybe I wear an iPod of just people laughing. <laughs> that's retarded. That would be funny. Because uh, then I'm killing. No matter what happens, I'm killing, folks. Enjoy yourselves in the audience. Because uh, there will be plenty of room to spread out. I, uh, uh getting on a plane <laughs> i'm flying friday because I, I, I it's so funny because it's all about selling tickets and trying to do that and get the show hyped and you, you look forward to it and you're excited and then all of a sudden when it shows up you're like oh oh man i gotta do the show part <laughs> and that's where i get into trouble it's so funny because when i would go out of town with jimmy and i would be excited to go to bo- clubs and i'd be oh i'm going to houston to play the last i'm going to baltimore to play the improv but then i would get there and i'd be sitting in the improv and like oh i actually got to do the show part of this now i <laughs> I loved the buildup of getting booked and flying out there and all that kind of stuff. That stuff was really fun. But then it was time to go up and make people laugh. I'm like, oh, no. God damn it. Because that's that's just goes that says stuff about me. All right. Look, that's just 
Because I do enjoy it when I'm doing it. It's great. It's just, and I'm getting past it now because as I'm doing the one man, it's more about me and more about, but uh, still you, you go, oh fuck, I got to go up because you got to deliver, man. That's the whole point. Otherwise you're, you're nobody. You never get anywhere. If you don't deliver, you're not going to make it happen. Right? What does that mean? If you don't deliver, you're not going to make it. <laughs> now he's only some idiot on a reality show. I watch, I, I, look, I don't like reality shows, but I'll watch cooking reality shows. Like I started watching Extreme Chef on the, on uh, the Food Network, which is hysterical to me. It, all right, look. If you're, go- if you're going on a fucking reality show, recognize that you're going to be on a reality show. Don't bitch about the conditions that you're under because you're on a reality show. Extreme Chef is called Extreme Chef because what it is is basically they take three chefs and they make them cook in the desert. And they have to run for their canned goods and then they have to cook on a, like a small fire and they got to cook. It's just, it is, it's ridiculous. It, it, it tests nothing of you as a chef. It, literally, recognize that. If you're a chef and you go on Extreme Chef, all they're checking to see is if you can maintain your composure through these conditions it has nothing to do with who you are as a fucking chef but the first show they were in some cul-de-sac and they had to cook like an appetizer on an engine block and then they they had rain fall on them and this guy there was oh we hated him he was he's look when you watch reality shows you hate everybody on them okay generally but uh then you'll see particular guys who drive you crazy this guy had a he had a salvador dolly mustache like a curly mustache and uh he's you know who he is he's pretentious tattooed chef asshole the guy that that got into chefery because he's like oh you know what i i'm gonna i'm a chef he wants to tell people how much of a chef he is he doesn't give a shit about making a chiffonade he doesn't care about making a soup he wants to tell you he's a fucking chef and wear his coat so uh he shows up on extreme chef and then he's got a like you know the here's a rusty razor blade to cut vegetables with, and it's gonna rain on you. And he's like, uh, in my restaurant, I have five burners and a bain marie, and uh, I can't believe I'm a five star restaurant guy. Why am I out here doing this? Cause you signed up for it, <laughs> Salvador fucking Dolly of the year 2011. If you want to make molecular gastronomy and create a fucking cappuccino foam in your fucking restaurant, stay there and do it. Don't sacrifice to go on television and then bitch about the fact that you're on goddamn television forced to cook in the middle of a street. You're doing it because it's called Extreme Chef. It wasn't called Let's Make Salvador Dali Look Like a Good Chef. Because that's the show you wanted to be on, motherfucker. But guess what? That show's not airing because nobody cares about you. Stay working in your restaurant, work hard, open your own restaurant, and maybe then you'll get some respect. But no, don't bitch about the fact that you got to cook shrimp in a Camaro engine. You signed up for it, motherfucker. We don't want to hear you crying about it. And then the rain, they made this fake, fake rain, like a rainstorm. It literally poured on them as they're trying to chop vegetables and make food. And uh, his fucking dolly mustache wilted. Oh. His wax could not hold up to the elements of Extreme Chef. Take that, dolly. And Karen and I hated him, actively hated him. Like saying we how much we hated him watching it. Bro, oh my God, I hate this guy. And dude, I have, I have really retreated into a doddering retirement. I have, I have... I wake up. I'm not kidding. I, I don't watch TV. I have uh I haven't watched the Daily Show in like three months. Like I I'm from March, April, May, June. No, July, four months. I have like 55 daily and Col- Daily Shows and Colberts on my DVR, and uh, it's forcing me to juggle all the other programs and move stuff around because I just I I, I became avalanched by them and I'd never missed them. I have never missed the Colbert Show ever. I've seen every single episode up until March first. Uh, and now, that's how far behind I am, March 1st. And I'm like, well, I'm going to watch these, right? Because I can't bear to fucking erase them, but I'm never going to watch them. Even if I was to watch eight a day, uh, fast forwarding through, because I don't watch it. You don't need to hear my fucking strategy for watching television. What the fuck is this? <laughs> Here's how I do it, folks. I sit down in a chair. Shut the fuck up, Dali of television. <laughs> Man, nobody cares. That, that, that's all. Everybody's self-involved. That's it. That's all they want to tell you about. And I'm self I'm the only guy on this podcast. Why shouldn't I be self-involved? <laughs> What am I chastising me for? I blame you folks for listening. <laughs> You've encouraged this for four goddamn years. If you didn't keep coming back and downloading in tens of hundreds, in teens, if my downloads weren't in the teens, I would not still talk to you people. If I was still in single digits, I would have quit a long time ago. But once it went over 10, I knew I had to keep talking. <laughs> Fuck. So I'm that far behind. But now when I turn on the television, literally the first thing I do is I turn on Food Network. I do I, in the morning because I'll get home in the morning from the graveyard gig and Karen will wake up and I'll go and I'll we'll, like have a, she might make an egg or two and then we'll sit down and I put on the Food Network. That's it. I, and that's all I watch. And it's like I'll because Karen I, and I, I actually thought about it today where I went. I need to ask Karen if she's sick of this. Like if she wants to do watch something else because we'll sit down and watch TV and I immediately turn on the Food Network and I'll go, OK, it's either this or and then I'll put on the guide and I'll look for the cooking channel. So I'm only going to flip to those two channels because I can't bear to watch anything else. I don't want because I don't want to watch the fucking world falling apart and all the news channels. 
Not I want to watch ridiculous sports hype and fucking, you know, I, I, I don't care. I don't care. I want to watch people make me a salad. That's all I want to do. I want to sit down and watch uh, the Barefoot Contessa make me spaghetti. That's it. And I hate the Barefoot Contessa. That's how much I, I love Food Network is I hate her and I still watch her goddamn show. Because she just, uh, she's so phony. Oh my God, she's so phony. And then she's talking about her husband who's a fucking hedge fund manager and they're, they're so rich. They live in this huge palatial estate and she has parties and she, they do this thing where she th- shows you how to throw a dinner party. The, the country's falling apart. <laughs> you ever see Gangs of New York? In Gangs of New York, the fucking, they have the war at the end and the five points and then all the people are getting, all the, all, you know, the, the poor people are being taken for the draft for the Civil War and the rich people are all sitting there kind of laughing and enjoying their, you know, vichy and then at the end, the poor people are like, well, fuck this, we're attacking the rich people. I'm waiting for the episode of Bear Cont- for Contessa where she makes a ham and the homeless people swarm the building and like rape her and eat the ham. Jesus Christ, because it's just when you watch it, it's just this I because I and I make myself watch it, but it's such an insult. It's such a slap in the face because they use she'll she'll be making like she made Vietnamese noodles today or some shit. And she's like, oh, you she had a she chopped the garlic and then she had a garlic press and she had like tools. Nobody has in their kitchen. Nobody has those tools. Half of America is cooking shrimp on a Camaro engine block. <laughs> and there's no cameras around to film it and show it on television. We're just doing it because we can't afford to pay for our gas anymore. Jesus Christ. But yet I watch those shows and they're like, here's how to throw a, 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 a dinner party for 18. I don't know 18 people. I certainly don't want to fucking feed them. But God damn it, I'll watch a show that tells me how to make soup for 18 people. I'm in. I watched Barbecue University all weekend. I watched like 14 episodes of Barbecue University because it's a guy teaching me how to grill shit. He's like, hey, here's how, here's how you grill oysters. Good, I'm in. I'm never going to do it in a billion years. I don't own a grill. There's a grill at my apartment complex, but it's not the kind that I can just commandeer and grill oysters. If I started to grill oysters at my building, the people who live there would come walking out. What the fuck are you doing? I'm, I've got a degree from Barbecue University. I'm grilling some oysters. Get the fuck out of here. Make a hot dog and go back to your apartment. Mr. One Bedroom for the last fucking 12 years. Don't be fancy. Nobody wants fancy in this goddamn apartment complex. We live here marking time till we die. Don't step up with your grilling North California, uh, Northern California oysters. You're not impressing anybody, motherfucker. I wasn't trying to impress you. I just wanted to have a grilled oyster. No, you didn't. <laughs> you're trying to make us think you're better than us. You're not. You're just like us. You live here, too. Make a goddamn generic hot dog and be done with it. <laughs> but I watch those shows and I can't stop. I watch Chopped. It's a competition of chefs trying to cook shit in 15 minutes, and I fucking love it. I can't. I, I pick a winner, and I root for them the whole way through, and then it ends, and I'm still me. Why am I still me? I don't want to be me. Oh, Christ. But we all find our distractions. Everybody finds their fucking distractions to get away from who they are and what the fuck they do. I watch Food Network. Everybody else watches a fucking trial. This fucking Casey Anthony trial. Everybody goes and watches that happen. It's like I and I would I was on the periphery of it. I didn't I didn't watch one second of coverage. All right. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't influence me in any way. And I got news for everybody else who was concerned about it. it doesn't influence you in any way either. Doesn't mean one thing to your tiny life. Not at all. It doesn't matter. You can sit there and moan and piss and cry about, oh my God, this poor six year old, she's dead. Who cares? She's dead. Exactly. She's dead. You summed it up. She's dead. You have no investment in this unless you invest yourself in it. <sighs> Turn on Ina Garten. Get away from the trial and watch the Barefoot Contessa make you a, 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 a fucking salad niçoise and some salmon. Turn on Barbecue University. He's not cooking a six-year-old. Watch him make something pleasant that you can maybe interpret and do something in your own house. Don't lose yourself in Casey Anthony. People got so upset they lost their fucking minds because she was found not guilty. What do you care? Why do you care? Just don't watch a reality show. That's, That's how you get back at her. Don't watch a reality show that she's going to have in a year. You watched her first reality show. Don't watch the second. People lost their minds. I, and, and then I see people come out of the woodwork. Marsha Clark comes out and she said, this is more shocking than the OJ trial. No, it wasn't. No, I don't care how long it's fucking been. You do not get to pass the buck on that one. She's like, oh, it's unbelievable because there was no racial element. There was no uh, there was no celebrity element. No, no. There, there, you know what there was? A fucked up prosecutor element, just like in the OJ trial. 
People try to trace back when the country went to hell, when everything started, started to change, and every, when everything. Uh, look, and it's been. A, everybody will tell you different. Eighty year olds will tell you it's a steep decline from the sixties. Everybody has their own fucking moment. But the OJ trial was the moment, right? For people my age, the OJ trial was the moment when you went, oh, oh man, everything's fucking, everything's fucked up, right? Everything's fucked up. And I'm not even talking about the verdict, okay? The verdict, I don't care. The verdict was the verdict. Remember the fuck happened? Who cares? Uh, but the, the actual trial. Uh, the chase. You know what? Fuck that. The trial. It was the goddamn chase. From the second he was found, they, they found his wife's body with her head cut off and a waiter who died because he was bringing her glasses over. Think about that. The waiter was murdered because he was bringing the glasses over. And then uh, they, you know, OJ's there and then Cato and then the bang on the house and then OJ fucking disappears. He, and then he's driving around in the Bronco. And, uh, you know, you know, here's the second when I knew it changed. Well, this is when I knew everything had changed. You know, fugitives go on the run. Everything happens. It was shocking to see a famous guy, you know, charged with murder. But then all of a sudden he's he's riding in the Bronco and he's talking and they're covering it live on TV. Here's when you knew the fucking country had changed, at least for me, people my age, when people were rooting for him on the street. That's when you went, oh, oh, fuck, everything is different. It, 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 it not really. And you know what? Honestly, when you think about it, you didn't sit there and just go, oh, my God, everything's different. But you, you realized, hey, this is weird. Why the fuck are they rooting for this guy? He supposedly killed these two people. And that's when you realize fame had trumped everything else. Mm-hmm. It had. And there was nothing you could do about it. And, and honestly, I wish now in retrospect I had taken that moment because now I can look back at it and, and appreciate that that's how I felt. But at the time, if I would have went, oh, you need to be rich and famous to get anything in this country. Like, if I. <laughs> If I would have taken, because up to that point, we had all aspired to be rich and famous. Everybody wanted to be rich and famous. You hoped to be rich and famous. At that moment, you should have realized, oh, fuck, you need to be rich and famous. <laughs> because if you're rich and famous, you can get away with whatever the fuck you want to get away with. Yep. And uh, for those of you out there who are like, well, Casey Anthony wasn't rich. Casey Anthony wasn't famous. She's in Florida. <laughs> okay. That trumps your rich and famous bullshit because in Florida, fucking anything can happen at any goddamn time. <laughs> Florida and Arizona are, are, you know, Texas looks at Florida and Arizona and goes, what the fuck is going on over there? <laughs> Jesus Christ. And it drove me crazy yesterday after the, the Casey Anthony verdict. Everybody's losing their minds and freaking out. Uh, on Twitter, uh, I, I happen to see, like, uh, you know, black people went crazy because they were saying, oh, it pays to be white in this country. You go ahead and you get off or something like that. You know, if that was a black girl, she would have been uh, immediately gone to jail. Look, I got news for you. If it was a black girl, wouldn't have been on television. <laughs> I mean, you know, whether she would have been guilty or not guilty, you wouldn't know the fucking first thing about it because it wouldn't have been on fucking television and Nancy Grace wouldn't have cared because the only reason it's on is because it was a six year old white girl. That's it. That's the only reason it got any coverage whatsoever. And because Casey Anthony was kind of hot and had hot Facebook photos. That's it. That's the only reason the fucking thing was on television and people still invested themselves in it and they lost their fucking minds. And then Marsha Clark steps up and says, oh, this is more shocking than OJ. I, I picture her saying it and looking around like hoping nobody notices. I picture her going, oh, this is more shocking than the OJ verdict. Right? Right? And just looking around for approval. Show, show of hands. Who says I'm off the hook? Christopher Darden just looking and shaking his fucking head. Good Lord. Why do people get invested? For the same reason that I watch people make goddamn stakes. That's it. Because we're all looking for a reason to get away from the fact that everything is falling apart. And uh, But that's the good news. Here in America, everything's falling apart, but we can go ahead and turn on television and watch somebody make us a goddamn meal and go, hey, that's great. Or we can lose ourselves in a trial and go, at least I'm not her. You know, it could be, you could live in the fucking Congo. I, that would be fucking terrible, folks. Dude, the fucking, I just read a story that in the Congo, uh, apparently like a, a year ago, there were rape squads wandering the Congo and showing up in villages and raping everybody in the village. And I mean everybody. They were like they were not. It wasn't like, hey, uh, all of you rapables, get to the side, and everybody else, we're going to take you off for a seminar or kill you. We haven't figured out exactly which yet. No, they raped everyone. They were indiscriminate. Uh, men, women, uh, children, uh, everybody. Everybody got raped. They showed up, and everybody got a turn on the ride, on the rape ride. And uh, now, it's terrible. I know it's awful. I mean, but again, we're not in the Congo, so again. Uh, it, it, you know what they need in the Congo? You know what they need? Direct TV. That's what they need. If they had a satellite dish, the second the rape squad was like, hey, man, let's go raping people. Hold on a second. Ina Garten is making the most wonderful Vietnamese noodle dish. Everybody calms down. Trust me. Everybody would calm down if they could just watch the Barefoot Contessa as she made lamb meatballs. They wouldn't think about raping an entire village. 
So these dudes fly around. They don't fly around. There's not a plane. Oh, my God. What if there was? <laughs> Dude, they have a rape plane. They fucking paint it on the side. People see it coming. They're like, oh, no. It's the rape plane. You just see it in the air. Look. Oh, dude. They're not a band. It's not like they're on a tour. Bill Graham is not presenting the Congolese rapists. That's not happening. I don't know how they get around in the Congo. They have a rape... Well, rape vans are in Haiti. They have a rape plane, apparently, in the Congo. They probably just get on horseback, right? It's the Congo. They're raping entire villages. They can't exactly have progressed to having Priuses. It's not like the Congolese rapists are showing up in Priuses and, and doing damage. Although that would actually be... That's a mixed message. If you're a bleeding heart liberal guy who wants to feel bad for those people, you're just like, well, the Congolese, at least they're saving the environment as they do this. No. Who's the enemy in that instance? Well, certainly they're raping entire villages, but at least they're saving the environment. Yes, because they want to emit, they don't want to emit greenhouse gases because if it gets too hot, they'll be too tired to rape everybody. That's why they drive the rape Prius. But these, and I, look, I don't know why I gravitate to these rape stories, but it's because he catches your eye. Look, I'm sorry. If I'm not watching the Food Network, I'm looking at the news, and if it's in the corner of your eye, you see rape in the margin, click. I click on it. So in the Congo, they rape everybody. They're going to villages and raping everyone. And then they leave. And leaving what can be, I assume, the most awkward conversation in their wake. That's got to be two days of looking at one of their own going, oh, you remember what happened on Wednesday? That's got to be the worst day in a long time, right? For the entire village? <laughs> nobody was looking forward to that, and nobody nobody recovers after that. That's just, a, it, you know, it takes a village to keep quiet about that, all right? That's what they do. So, because uh, they do, and, but uh, apparently they reported it, all right? So that's, that's why, they, that's how I know about it. So uh, these villages, they were not going to sit still for this sort of behavior, and I don't blame them, because uh, not only is there raping occurring, but the plane is destroying their crops as it swoops in. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what they're growing in the Congo. Um, you know, they should be growing my fucking machetes to fight off the rape squad. Plant a machete tree. And when it fucking blossoms, just grab one and just sit there and wait. Uh, so then they rape everybody in these villages and then the people complained. And uh, it's been like almost a year and uh, nobody's gone to jail for it. Like one guy, I guess, got convicted for it. And now the rape squads decided uh, we're putting the band back together. <laughs> Because they told the villages not to say anything, and then the villages went ahead and spoke up, thinking there would be justice. Guess what? No. No justice, no peace, friends. And, uh, and now the rape squads are there firing up the plane and ready to go back out on tour. Oh, no. And I'm like, God damn it. Send them satellite dishes. Please calm them down. Anything. What can we do? You can't do anything because the Congolese government won't do anything. That's the thing. And it's like, what do you do? Uh, does Obama make a phone call? Obama can't control shit here. He can't control shit in the Congo. And you just read about it. and You're like, oh, my fu- I What can I do? You wish this is when you wish there was a Superman. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just one dude who could go over there or like Rambo. You know what I mean? Just one dude who could go and fucking massacre all of these dudes and just and just uh, wear a cock necklace of all of them and just warn everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, he should just gas their entire village, put them to sleep, and then put them under for surgery, and then stretch their cocks out and cut them off and make a cock necklace. That's what you do. <laughs> Mother of God. So, I mean, as bad as it is here, at least we we're able to watch a trial and watch cooking shows that distract us from the fact that our entire economy is crumbling <laughs> and everything is fucking falling apart. Oh, but by the way, happy 4th of July. Happy birthday, America. <laughs> Looking good in your old age. That should be our slogan. Instead of Stars and Stripes Forever, it should be, at least we don't have rape planes. <laughs> at least your village is safe from rape. Because everyone's too fat and sitting around watching television. Oh How has it not fallen? And again, I recognize fully that this could be the, the, the start of my you kids get off my lawn phase. I understand that I'm that old and maybe it's just an old guy looking and, and young guys, young people still have optimism, but I can't believe it if they do. But the only optimism they have is they're like, uh, you know, remember, all right, again, I'm a grandfather. Please keep this in mind. But when you were a kid, everybody was like, oh man, I'm going to open a store or I might open a restaurant or I might go ahead and, and do, uh, you know, I'm going to build something. And now kids are like, I'm going to invent an app. What is that going to do for anybody but but you? Right, exactly, for me. That's all I care about. Because that's all anybody cares about is themselves. And believe me, I'm not saying you shouldn't. All I fucking care about is me. 
me and my wife and I just want to pay my bills and try to get everything I can to a zero so I can fucking start over. Uh, although Lily, I told Lily that and she's just like, why do you even care about your bills then? Why do you just say fuck everything? And I'm like, oh, you can't, you just, because I'm not an anarchist. I might be a nihilist, but I mean, I, you know, I might like chaos, but I like to see chaos around me. I don't want to be involved in personal chaos because, the, dude, you know, that chaos isn't fun. That chaos, you know, if I look, if I want to be involved in chaos, that's like blowing shit up and, and, and you know, shooting people. That's fine. That's fun chaos. But chaos, <laughs> chaos where you just let your bills lapse and then you got to deal with phone calls from creditors. That's just that's like a million tiny knives of chaos. That's that's like just cutting your like one wrist with a nick and bleeding out for like weeks and fucking weeks. Bullshit. I want to sew a grenade into my balls and blow the fuck up. If I'm on chaos, I want it to come in one fell fucking swoop. I don't want to just die slowly. Fuck that. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. I didn't do anything. I because again, I work at night, so I was able to sleep during the day, and then Karen went to the fireworks by herself. Uh, because that's, you know, but that's partially because she has initiative and she went to do it and partially because she knows I don't really care so much for fireworks. And also I had to work that night. Uh, but I'll be honest with you. The, the, I had to work that night was the smallest part of it. <laughs> the other part is that I actually, I, I had like a headache and I didn't feel good. And then she just went on her own, but I should go. I should go. That's one thing my wife really likes is fireworks. Why couldn't I go to work with her? Because I'm a terrible, terrible husband. She's like, Hey, we got to clean out that storage area in the back. And I'm like, all right, just let me know when. And then Friday she's like, we'll clean it out tomorrow. I go, you can't just tell me a, a day in advance. <laughs> You got to give me like a week in advance. I need to know when it's coming up. I need to prepare myself Uh, because that's how I am. And we didn't have to clean it out, thankfully. Uh, I I talked about that a year ago, that storage area, and it still sits uncleaned. Uh, I'm going to open it up now. What could possibly be in there? I don't think I'm hoping that the moths have eaten whatever the fuck it is. It's just a bunch of empty boxes. Cool. I'll throw it out. I just want to get dirty. All right. Uh, (laughs) It's terrible. Uh, July 1st came, which is a big change, as you all know, as I told you. Uh, I think I have a web guy, and once I get him passwords and get him up to speed and everything, then I can start blogging again and doing the Rocky with the blog stuff. Uh, I have not started working out yet. I'm taking this in uh, in pieces, because again, I haven't worked out in fucking forever, so I can't just jump back into it, but I need to start walking. There's a bunch of stuff I gotta do. Uh, but you're asking what the progress has been like for the first week. I don't doubt that you want to know. Uh, well, I will tell you this. I have eliminated supplies. I haven't had candy in a week, which is good. That's a big deal. Uh, and I'm trying to eat. I, I ate a ton of fruit. I'm eating edamame. Uh, you know, still, unfortunately, I'm, I, I'm trying to figure it out with my schedule because I wake up at fucking, you know, seven o'clock at night. So it's time for breakfast with me. So I'll have dinner with Karen and that's breakfast. But then in the middle of the night, I have to eat something, uh, and there's nothing to eat. Like I, I don't, we haven't gone grocery shopping. So I, I had to go, I went to in and out like a couple times this week, but the thing is you don't get fries because fries are death. Uh, they, they are, they're like the worst fucking thing you can eat. And I told Mex that one time we were, <laughs> this is when I had just had my surgery. I was home in Chicago. I think I told the story on here. We were in, uh, we went to Portillo's cause I literally was going to get a hot dog and just eat like two bites of it. That's all I wanted. And, uh, and I go, yeah, but oh, he goes, you can't eat here, right? You shouldn't eat here. I go, no, I can eat basically anything I want. Just a little of it. I can't go crazy. Like I used to, I said, and French fries are the worst. I go, they're the worst fucking thing you could possibly eat. So we got to the window. He's like, what do you want? I go, I need a jumbo hot dog, no mustard, no peppers and a large fry. <laughs> And he goes, I'm not getting you a French fry. I go, what do you mean? I, I want a French fry. He goes, you just told me French fries are death. Like, that's what you, literally what you said. So, uh, and he wouldn't get them. He, he forced me not to have them, I think. He's going he's gonna to tell me either way. I think, if I remember correctly, he did not order them. Uh, but yeah, so I, so I don't get fries now. So, but I got, you know, a uh, hamburger. Uh, but then you try not to eat, like, the bun, whatever the fuck. It's still not wrong. I shouldn't be eating fast food. I get that. But I haven't had any, like, candy and stuff, which is good. But, um, we made the mistake like yesterday. All right. Fat Mike took over yesterday because we went out. I had to get my hair cut yesterday because I'm going out of town, as you know. Uh, so I stayed up all morning to go get it done. And then it was lunchtime. And I said to Karen, she's like, well, you know, we should go get lunch. And she's like, where do you want to eat lunch? And we that dance fucking started. So we're in the car figuring it out. So then we were driving and uh, right by my house, there's a Shakey's. Uh, Shakey's has a buffet for lunch. And uh, Fat Mike used to love to go to Shakey's Buffet. And I was like, let's go to Shakey's. And she's like, all right, I'll go. Which I was not prepared for because Karen hates Shakey's. But she was like, let's go. So we pulled in and uh, we go to Shakey's and we order food. The, the buffet, which is you know, seven bucks, whatever. And uh, 
the Shakey's Buffet shouldn't even be called the Shakey's Lunch Buffet. It should it should just be called Shakey's. Uh, you know, hey, poor people, we're open for lunch. <laughs> Because it's seven bucks and all it is is fucking fried starch fucking nonsense. It's just you walk down the aisle and look, they have a salad bar that has, you know, a tumbleweed blowing over it because none of the fat <laughs> Hispanic people at, at uh, eating lunch there are going for the salad bar. OK, uh, the loneliest chickpeas in the universe sit in a <laughs> container over there. I saw them out of the corner of my eye and I even, I even in my head I went, I, you know, I should just get a salad. I like salad. And I go, ah, I'm at Shakey's. Come on, I gotta eat Shakey's food. So at Shakey's, they have like four different kind of pizza uh, and then you walk down the aisle then they have spaghetti noodles with a red sauce that I'm sure is homemade uh, and then they have brown like rice pilaf and corn and then they have fried chicken and fried mojo potatoes and then they have a roasted chicken and uh, there was one other like meat thing there. I forget what it was. Uh, but it, regardless, it doesn't matter. Everything is fried. E- everything besides the roasted chicken. But even that's covered in butter. Like they throw, you know, they they cover a chicken in butter and they throw it in a fucking stove. So I walk down and I'm taking some. And I'm I'm not building up because I all right. Look, I've been to buffets since the surgery and I can't fill a plate up, uh, but I can still grab a few things and eat a few things. So I grabbed a. Uh, a, a two fried chicken legs and I grabbed some mojo potatoes because Fat Mike took over a little bit and started to fill the plate up. And I took rice and I took corn and I took pizza and I went and sat down and I'm eating and I ate one piece of pizza. And what I usually do is I'll eat a half a piece of something and I put it on Karen's plate. I'm like, you can eat this or throw it out. I don't care. I don't want it. But then I ate rice and corn together, which is like, it's like a shaky succotash, which I make. And, uh, and then I'm eating fried chicken and I'm eating it. And, uh, and I, I, I guess I ate kind of fast. I don't know what the fuck happened. All I is I ate it and it felt like, I had a fried fist in my stomach. <laughs> it, it was like I had eaten a fucking fried anvil. Boom. And it, it dropped anchor in my stomach. And I'm like, all right, well, what I have to do then is I have to just sit there and wait. Because the thing is, I can eat, but I have to eat slowly. This is one of the problems I'm having now is uh, I will go eat and I will eat until I'm full at a place. But I can't. It doesn't take much to fill me up. All right. So I'll eat until I'm full and then we'll leave. And then an hour and a half later, I'm hungry because... I haven't eaten very much. But I only ate till I was full. What I need to do is I need to pace myself and eat slowly uh, and make it work that way. And then in my head, just tell yourself, you're not hungry anymore, stupid. Uh, because, again, I still have a fat head. But unfortunately, now I have the fat body to match. I had lost it. Now it's back. But not like it used to be. All right. Oh, I weighed in. I weighed in on the first. By the way, I will tell you all. Uh, 360. That's where I'm at. Uh, that's 20 pounds heavier than I was when I was fucking horrified with my weight. So 360 on July 1st, and it's only going to go down from there. I, I share it with you, not that you care, but I tell you just because. Uh, so then I go to Shakey's, I eat the chicken, and I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting to kind of calm down. And uh, here's the never-ending problem, and fat people might agree with me, even real people might agree with me. You're full, but you still want to eat stuff because it tastes good. That's it. That's that's the enemy. So uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, uh, well, fuck, I could probably eat a couple more pieces of chicken or something. Because, you know, I can't eat pizza, and I know it, but I want corn and rice, whatever. So I'm, I wait... I wait about 20 minutes. Karen finishes her plate of food and then she goes get some soda and she goes to get some more food. And then I go, you know what? I'm going to get more. So I go to the front and I get a, a chicken leg. I'm only eating chicken legs, but I get a roasted chicken leg. I get another fried chicken leg and I eat uh, some mojo potatoes, which are, by the way, fried potato slices. All right. Literally breaded and fried potato slices. Uh, remember I said French fries were death. Imagine round, flat French fries. Like they're just French fries with more area, surface area. And uh, they're horrible. They're complete death. They're almost instant death, but I still grabbed them. And, uh, and then I had some fried chicken and I had regular chicken and I ate corn and rice cause I like corn and rice. And again, this is all food that fills you up in a starch. It's nothing. It's just, this is the kind of food you would eat in the woods to survive. <laughs> like it's K rations. You know what I mean? It's like you would, you would cook a, a bird over an open flame and then you would have rice and corn to stay full. Uh, so I bring it over to the table and I'm eating it. I eat the corn and rice and I eat the chicken and, uh, I start to get like groggy, like sweaty groggy because I've, I've overeaten too much. And it's like my stomach is only a certain size. And here's the thing. Uh, I'm like a bird, folks, because uh, you know, how you're not supposed to feed bird. You're not supposed to throw rice at a wedding because a bird eats it and he swells up and dies. That's who I am <laughs> because I eat rice and it swells up in my tiny stomach and it causes me to be full. Well, if I only ate rice, that would be fine. But instead, I ate I ate four chicken legs and some corn and some rice and one piece of pizza. Uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm starting to get sweaty and I'm in pain. Like it, it, it actual is physical pain. And, uh, when this happens, there's only one thing I can do about it. 
Well, there's two things. I could realize that I've made a mistake and I could live with it and say to myself, you know what, dude, this is what you get for fucking up. And now you have to go through these trials and tribulations. Or I could do uh, the thing that I've actually become very comfortable doing. I can go throw up. So uh, in my head, I'm like, well, I got to just, yeah, I got to throw up. That's what I got to do. Because otherwise, I, it's literally, I'm going home and going to bed. I'll never be able to sleep. I mean, like, I can't, it's painful. I can't even explain. Imagine if you ate so much food, and we've all done that, where you've become overfull. And then imagine you had one more plate. And even worse, folks, it's 100 degrees outside. So imagine it's 100 degrees outside and you have a belly full of rice and fried chicken and you're sweaty and you, you, you feel disgusted with yourself and you're disgusting and you, you just you know you've made a mistake. I got to get rid of it. I got to launch. All right. Uh, because it's just it's terrible. It's like uh, if you try. Oh, I don't want to. Uh, it's horrible. Never mind. I'm not going to make that analogy. I keep wanting to make a fist analogy and I'm not going to do it. All right. Um, so I just I got to cough up this food, baby. I'm like, all right, I got to get it out of me. So. Uh, I go to the restroom at Shakey's. I get and Karen. Uh, Karen knows at this point. She's she's pretty much aware of what's going to happen because uh, she'll. I'll go. Hey, I have to use the restroom. So I get up and I walk over. And as I'm walking, there's two guys ahead of me, and they go in to the restroom ahead of me. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to wait in fucking line. But I go in, and one of them's using the sink, and one of them's using the urinal. So I go into the into the stall. Uh, now, some of you might think to yourselves, well. You're not going to throw up while there's people in there, right? Uh, I don't give, I don't fucking don't care, all right? Because uh, honestly, it's a bathroom. There's all sorts of horrible things going on in there. Anything short of jerking off is fair game. <laughs> I'm not kidding, because you walk in, guys are, you know, the guys will take a shit in there, guys will use the urinal, and they'll blast ridiculous farts, and they're horrible, and they laugh. I, let's, ladies, I'm going to tell you this right now. Uh, you, unless you've been in a men's restroom, you've never seen strangers high five over a fart. <laughs> I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. Oh Usually it's at like at a ball game or something, but some guy will let one go and everybody's like, ha ha, yeah, like they cheer. And it's like, oh, it's all falling apart. That's when you actually root for the Congolese rape plane to swoop in and teach all these guys a lesson. So I go in and uh, so I'm in the stall and uh, I, I, you know, basically, look, we all know what happens. You have to throw up. So uh, I've got to take my right hand and go as far down my throat as I possibly can to encourage this fried chicken to take an exit route. Now, this might be a little late in the game for this, but I'm going to warn you folks, this isn't going to be pretty. <laughs> I just want to make sure you know that now. Okay. Uh, because, you know, I will tell you this, the throwing up thing. It gets to who I am as a guy and it gets to why I'm in the situation I'm in now because I always take the easy way out. The smart thing to do would be, like I said, I had this surgery uh, and I had decided for a year I was working out hard and I ate right and I knew what I was doing because I decided in my head, I said, you know what, you've done whatever you wanted to do for, you know, 38 years. Now it's time to pay the check. Uh, and I did. I paid the check for two years and then unfortunately backslid into a fucking spiral of ridiculousness and, and opened up a new tab. Uh, I was always a guy who looked for a shortcut. I was always a guy who tried to take the easy way out. And that's who I am. And now, and you know what? Just eating what the fuck you want and throwing up is a complete shortcut. It's antithetical to who you should be and what you should be doing. But it's worked for me. So I've made myself do it. What I need is I need somebody to teach me a lesson. I need something bad to happen because you know, that's the thing is the throwing up never hurt me. It never bothered me. I never wound up with any sort of, you know, uh, uh, residual illness. Uh, I didn't, you know, burst a blood vessel. And, you know, it's, it was just easy. I would eat and then I would go in and I would puke and I would walk out and uh, I would just throw some water in my face and it would be fine. And Karen would look at me and shake her head and go, did you? And I'd go, yeah, you know, I did. And she'd be like, oh, you got to stop that. And I go, I know, but it was so easy to fucking do. Let's go back to Shakey's. <laughs> so I eat all this ch fucking fried chicken and rice and corn. It's all in my stomach and it's just having a huge brawl. And I walk in. There's two guys. One guy's using the urinal. One guy's using the sink. I go right into the stall. And uh, I don't touch anything in the stall. As you know, I'm sure none of you do. Uh, I use my shoes. I flush with my shoe. I flush with, I kick the fucking seat up with my shoe. I touch nothing. 
It's a public restroom. It's a bathroom. It's disgusting. I want nothing to do with it, especially in a fucking shakies. Because everybody in that building is cramming fucking chorizo jalapeno pizza and fried chicken into their faces and then shitting it out in the bathroom. I want nothing to do with any of it. All I want to do is get rid of this fucking roiling cocktail in my stomach. So I head up. I, I just immediately, I, I look, it's, I actually have a routine. I know what I'm doing. I walk in, I kick the seat up. I bend over and you go right hand and you go two fingers all the way down your throat. And you just start, uh, like, put your fingers out right now as if you were, uh, like, Bruce Lee and you were pointing to someone to come fight you and you just go like that. All right, uh, look, th- all right, this will, <laughs> when you're looking for, when you're G-spot hunting, all right, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and you get that move with your finger, the, the two fingers, that's what I do. I look for the G-spot in my throat oh my to make my, to, to food come, all right? Because that's what I do. I put my hands down into my throat and I just start moving my fingers around until I hit the food G-spot and then boom, I launch. I squirt. So uh, I mentioned it was going to be bad, folks. I apologize. Uh, so I go into Shakey's and I bend over and I jam my hand in my throat and I start fucking working my food G spot in my throat to get it to, to food squirt. And uh, it starts to come up and like a little bit comes up. All right. And uh, and then I'm and I'm still standing. And you still got your hand in your throat, still getting it ready. And uh, I can hear these guys. They're talking because I guess they were together. And uh, they're, t- you know, one guy's laughing. He's at the urinal still. They got the sink running. They're laughing. And uh the first wave comes out of me and uh, it goes in, in, you know, into the toilet and there's a very distinctive noise it makes and you all know what it is and I don't have to tell you, but I should tell you that it happens and uh, immediately these two guys stop talking because they hear it. Okay. Uh, But uh, that one comes out and then as I'm, I'm, you know, of course you take your hand out and wait and then you put your hand back in to look for more to work the food G spot and get, cause there's obviously a lot more. Uh, and unfortunately I look, I've got my head like near the shaky's toilet. And for some reason, the shaky's toilet is abnormally full of water. Usually you go into a toilet, especially in California in a public restroom and they use those water saver things. So there's barely any water in there. And actually, I got to flush like three or four times to get rid of whatever the fuck uh, comes out of my horrible gut. So I got my hand in my mouth and I realized, I go, oh, wait, there's a lot of water in there. And as I got my fingers in, these guys are quiet, except the sink is still running. I got my finger. I'm working, looking for the food G spot. Second wave comes. And this is, the, you know, a, a much larger wave because, again, it comes in levels because you're unearthing. All right. You're digging and getting to the bottom of things. Uh, food comes flying out of my mouth. And it was as if I dropped a bowling ball into a bucket of water. It hits the water and it splashes all over my face. The food came out and it, it, it plummeted into the toilet water and the toilet, like, curse bloosh, it all splashed up all over my face. And I'm looking and I'm, I'm look, I don't want to touch the door. And I got my face in a toilet and the water splashed. All This has never happened. In the years, the, in the three years I've been successfully making myself throw up in public, <laughs> I have never fallen victim to the backsplash. <laughs> and I, dudes, I fucking lost my mind because I, I still got my hand in my mouth and it's cursed bloosh and it comes up and it hits me in the face and I'm in the middle of throwing up. There's nothing I can do about it. I can't run. I can't get away. <laughs> Because food is still coming out of my mouth and I'm like, oh, and I'm way, and it's coming out of me and it's hitting the toilet and it's splashing up and it splashes me again. Because otherwise the only, the only thing I can do at that point is put my hands in front of my, and grab it my hands and then gently lay it in as if I'm giving it a burial at sea. Oh my God. So I, I unleash like a third one and it splashes the water and the water splashes up on me again. And these guys, you just hear them walk out. Like they, the sink is still running. They just, I think they just panicked because they knew what was happening and i actually went to yell like make a noise but i couldn't yell because uh because stuff was coming out of my stomach and it was like my throat was clogged with food and there's water in my face and i mean i like it's dripping off my face it's like that it's that much it wasn't like a sploosh like a it wasn't look someone puts a splash of toilet water behind their ear fantastic i just it looked like i put my face in the toilet that's how much splashed up and hit me and finally, there's nothing I can do but sit there and kind of take it and let all of this stuff come out of my mouth. 
and I'm I'm vomiting, and it's finally it finishes, and I I fucking elbow open the stall. I can't open it fast enough. I first I flush the toilet, and I got to make sure I flush it a couple times to get everything out of it. So I'm standing there fucking dripping. I get over to the sink, and the sink is still running. I put my head in the sink, which also is not sanitary. <laughs> I recognize that. But uh, I put my head in the fucking sink and I just let, I start letting hot water pour all over my face. And I'm, I'm, I'm basting myself as if I were a pork shop. I'm like grabbing it with my hand and throwing water in my ears all over my hair. I'm soaking my hair in my face. I'm, I'm pouring. I'm, I could actually put my hand in and close the, over the sink thing so the sink would fill up with water and I could just keep my face submerged in it. Like I'm just letting it because it's so disgusting and horrible. I grab the soap and I fucking it's that I, I fill my hands with it and I start washing my face. I gotta be honest with you. That fucking pink liquid soap in the in the restroom, <laughs> that smells worse than shit water. I mean, it's just fucking horrible. It literally smells like I I jammed my head into fifth grade. That's what it fucking smells like. So I'm fucking I'm washing my face and I'm trying and like kind of my hair with with the fucking pink soap, and I just hear the door open, and I I don't turn around. I get my head in the sink and I'm cover, I'm washing my hair with pink fucking soap. And my head, and I hear the door open, and then I just hear uh, a guy come in and go, "Excuse me," and walks out. Just walks the fuck out, because I'm bent over in the fucking sink with washing a sudsy hair, which they got to be used to, because it's you know it's on fucking uh, uh, Magnolia or Laurel, Laurel Canyon Boulevard. Every homeless guy in the world must go there and take a fucking bath. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking a homeless guy bath in the fucking Shaky's bathroom after fucking vomiting out the contents of my stomach, and uh, I stand up, and there's no mirror. That's how you know you're in a classy joint when they got no mirror. And I just grab as many towels as I can and I dry my face and I dry my arms and I walk out and uh, everybody is looking at me. Like every, everyone turns around. Once I open the door, because obviously the two guys who had been in there were with one big group and then the person who came in after me went out and told his group, whatever the fuck. All I know is the, I, I walk out and every head turns to look at me except one, Karen. I just see the back of her head and she's looking out of traffic. She's not really noticing anything. So I got to approach from the rear for her. Everybody watches me. They watch me walk. I'm dripping. I'm soaking wet. And uh, I just go to the booth and I sit down and I sit and uh, Karen, she's looking outside and she looks at me and her eyes get, cr- I mean the widest I think I've ever seen her fucking eyes. And she goes, are you okay? I said, yeah. And she goes, did you? I go, what do you think? <laughs> She goes, you need to stop doing that. And I go, you know what? I think that point was driven home very clearly today. (laughs) Because it's time to stop taking the easy way out. It's time to just eat whatever the fuck you want and then go ahead and vomit. Because again, it had never been a problem. It was always like, I never even looked at it as a sanitary, unsanitary thing. I was just like, yeah, because it was clean. You know why? I don't have stomach acid. All right, I'll tell you that. I don't have any stomach acid because of my operation. So all that comes out is the food. There's no burning. There's no bile. There's none of that horrible residual taste you get in your mouth. It's literally like just you're rebooting. You're taking out what was in there and you're fine. You rinse your mouth out and you're okay. It doesn't have a disgusting taste at all. It's just you got rid of old food. You chewed it once. Now you're just getting rid of it. Uh, But now that the disgusting element has been added into it, I think it now is a lesson (laughs) That I go ahead and stop taking the easy way out in my life and make things work the way they should, right? <laughs> because it was awful. I mean, I, I just picture everybody coming in there. It must have been, I must have looked like the guy from Alien. Like, literally. <laughs> because you hear the noise, you're just like, oh, 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 and then something comes bursting out of my chest. And then you just hear muffled fucking yells and, and uh, splashing and water. Because, I mean, let's face it, I'm in there, I'm covered in water, I'm trying to yell, but I can't because there's fucking food coming out of me and the toilet is splashing on me. Uh, it was just like Alien. You know why? Because fucking in shakies, no one can hear you scream. <laughs> you guys can get me at Mike and Mike Schmidt Comedy.com. You can follow me at twitter.com slash the 40-year-old boy. You can be my friend at facebook.com slash the 40-year-old boy. You can follow our friend Lily Von Stupp at twitter.com slash Lily Von Stupp or twitter.com slash MNTs. And if you want to write her a personal note and uh, find out exactly what time we're getting finished with recording today, it's a new record, folks. You can go ahead and write her at lily at burlesque411.com. That's lily, L-I-L-I, at burlesque411.com. No. I'm doing something. I will. I will. I'm doing something. As soon as I'm finished. Yes, I'm using a coaster. 
thing to the 40 year old boy. This is Parker from Pod Gods telling you to go to Zazzle.com slash 40 year old oh boy. Zazzle.com slash 40 year old boy. Please buy all this. Please buy. Please buy all. Please. Stupid. Want to remind you folks about the Monday Night Tees every Monday night at the three clubs on Santa Monica and Vine. It's the longest running, most successful, nakedest burlesque show in town here in Los Angeles. Uh, 10 o'clock p.m. Again, I said every Monday night, Santa Monica and Vine at the three clubs. You know, I happen to know the proprietor of that show. Her name is Lily Von Stupp. Uh, she's a proprietor of this show as well. Hey, Lily. <laughs> Hi, so uh, how was this week's show? This week's show was an amazing show. Okay. I was really, really proud of it. It was a good show. I I actually got to sit back and laugh and watch the show for once. It was really fun. Very cool. And that was a 4th of July show. It was. Fireworks. Yes. Nude fireworks. Did anyone get a snake burn? No. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> that's a show you come to then. Uh, we didn't have any, we didn't do fireworks this year. We, we did it last year. We had Snap and Pops. And we had sparklers this year, but we didn't light them. Because uh, again, I was I had a headache and I was sitting on the couch. I, I lit a match and blew it out to celebrate. Yay! I was like happy birthday, America, and it was over. Mm. Oh Jesus! Very this is taking a sad turn for the worse. <laughs> uh, so there's a show coming up this week, yes. Yes. And uh, is it a, a fancy show? Is it a theme show? It is a theme show. Oh my God! What's the theme? Detroit rocks. Detroit rocks city, like Rock City. Oh, okay. So like, it's. All All right, so all all the music will be like bands from Detroit, yep. and then uh, all the chicks will be hot girls from L.A. taking their clothes off. No, but no import band, nobody from Detroit coming. No, no. Do they even have burlesque in well, Detroit? The do they thing. wait? Do they even have clothing in Detroit anymore? They, I have no. Idea. It's the wild. They do. Here's the thing, though. See, the reason we're doing this. Show, Get closer to this. People have complained. The reason the reason we're doing this show is it's Estella Detroit's birthday, and Estella Detroit is a great L.A. performer here. Who moved here from Detroit? That works out great. So, all right. So that's so it's a celebrating of Estella so Detroit's birthday. Her birthday. And we're celebrating it with all of the Detroit bands. That is so stupid people that you're doing complain. that. Let them complain. People complain are like, people are like, oh, we can't hear Lily at the end when she does the plug. And this is a plug for your show. Why the fuck wouldn't we do it? It's silly. And again, like I said, we used to talk. To okay. Well, in that case, I'll just take the mic over here and I'll just keep it. <laughs> the look on your face. Astonishing! I can't believe you. Yeah, the balls on you, the balls on you, which are ticking. Stop! See, this is why we don't, folks. This is why, this is why we don't do it. Because she starts talking, and then she's like, "Oh yeah, I'm supposed to talk, right?" And then she talks a million times about nothing. Who she thinks she is? Me. You should host the forty-year-old lady, forty-year-old uh, girl, forty-year-old lady. That's stupid. That's a real show. <laughs> that would be awful. Who listens to the forty-year-old lady? That's just the most boring title. There's no turn. There's no twist. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, so remember, go to the three clubs, uh, Santa Monica and Vine, ten o'clock Monday night. The big theme show for Detroit Rocks this week. Are you dancing? No. Are you hosting? Picking no. up? Who's doing Nugent? Someone's got to be doing uh, Ted. Unfortunately, no one. It's the one. Hold that on. That no one could do. Wait a minute. Yeah. You're doing a Detroit show. Yes. And there will be nobody dancing to the Motor City Madman. I know. Really? Yes. I might fucking show up and dance to Ted Nugent. That, you have I, got I, to I be kidding more. me. I wanted to, but I don't have enough time to put the act together. I don't. I, who the fuck it. can't dance to? Oh, my God. All right. Now, folks, look, just go, I guess. But, man, no Nugent. That's just. Well, he'll be in the pre-show and the intermission music. Uh, I mean, it's all going to be. Everybody's but good. I understand. To, to, to M and M, I mean, you've got a huge range. Yes, we do. Motor City Madman. <laughs> you can make all the excuses you want. You can be like, "Hey, there's a huge range in M and M," and then there's Motown. I get all that. Motor City Madman. Ah, <laughs> oh, cry. All right, that's fine. I understand, folks. The show will be great, but just know as you're watching it and going, "This show's really great." It's not as great as it could be. Oh, there could be even more greatness you're afoot. Old. Uh, I'm I'm old. You just There's mentioned Motown. People, Motown. People yes, White Stripes works. Absolutely. 
fucking Nugent. All right. Okay. That's fine. Folks, remember okay, you can go to... Okay, uh, don't come. It's going to suck. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's that bad, but I think it's it's Nugentless. I mean, well, let's face it. Any show that's Nugentless is going to suck. I mean, Nugent makes every show better, whether it's Detroit or not. He should be involved in all of your goddamn shows. He's got you in a stranglehold, baby. Oh, God damn it, Nugent. Remember to go to Facebook.com, folks. You can be my friend at Facebook.com. And also on Facebook.com, there's all sorts of pages that you can find to bring me to your town. There's uh, Bring Mike to Kansas City, Bring Mike to Atlanta, Bring Mike to Boston. Uh, bring Mike to uh, Milwaukee. Bring Mike to Chicago. That's coming up possibly someday. Uh, remember, folks, that I am coming live this Friday night to Seattle, Woo-hoo! July 8th uh, at the Rendezvous Theater. Tickets are still on sale, and I'm assuming will be for a while. <laughs> uh, right up to the very second I say hello, Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be taking your cash. Uh, so come on out to the Rendezvous Theater and, uh, and uh, you know, just buy a ticket. If you want to buy a ticket, that'd be great. I, I should tell you, if you're buying a ticket, buy it now. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of walk-up stuff. I don't know. I've just found out I'm, I'm still negotiating with them regarding a person at the front door to take tickets and money and, and all that. Uh, she's like, she wrote me back. She's like, I thought you said you had somebody doing that. I'm like, uh, I don't I don't think I said that. But she and I can't talk to one another because we're playing phone tag because uh, I sleep when she's awake. Uh, because I'm Santa Claus. Um, but uh, So I'll be in Seattle this Friday, July. Tickets are still on sale. Remember that I will be in Philadelphia, July 29th. That's at the end of the month at the Plays and Players Theater. Tickets are available on Brown Paper Tickets. Links are available on the Facebook page. Go find the Bring Mike Schmidt to Philadelphia page and sign up. Go ahead, click through and buy a ticket. Tickets are selling for that. Uh, remember that I'm coming to New York, folks. Mike Schmidt is coming to New York. I'll be at the uh, Producers Club Crown Theater. Uh, in downtown Manhattan, that will be on. Uh, I think it's in downtown. I have no idea if it is. I know it's on, <laughs> like forty second. It's it's close to Times Square. I know that it's in the area. So, uh, so come on out to. Uh, that's bring Mike Schmidt to uh, New York. I will be there. The success is not an option. Tour is coming to New York. What are you looking for? You got me freaked out. I had a map of New York City. Oh. Well, it's not important. These people can look it up. We have, if they have the internet, they know where I'm going to be. <laughs> so go to the Producers Club Theater, the Crown Theater at the Producers Club. Uh, that's Friday, August 12th. So come on out and check that show out. And uh, folks, Philadelphia, Denver, Seattle, all happening. And uh, another city has joined the Success what? Is Not an Option Tour. That's right. Folks, Friday, September 16th. Denver, Colorado. You will fall under the spell of the Success is Not an Option Tour. Mike Schmidt is coming to town at the Dangerous Theater. Denver's Dangerous Theater, which is conveniently located close to downtown Denver near 125, oh no, I-25 and 6th Avenue. I was going to say 125th. Uh, Near I-25 and 6th Avenue. It's a warehouse theater. Uh, The woman who runs it seemed very nice. Some people recommended some people from Denver. Now look, I'm going to throw this out there, folks. Uh, I'm throwing this out to Denver. Other people, you can listen if you'd like. But Denver... I took a leap on this, Denver, okay, because the Facebook page only has like 22 people on it, but you've been very vocal. People keep writing me like personal emails telling me I've got to come and coming up with theaters and coming up with venues. People have been very active. So I'm hoping that you same people will come to the show and buy tickets so this woman doesn't realize that I'm a fraud because <laughs> I called her and I talked to her and she's very nice uh, and uh you know, we worked it out. There was an arrangement. I, had, I was on the phone with her for a while, but it worked out great to where it turns out I will be in Denver Friday, September 16th uh, at the Dangerous Theater. So tickets are on sale now. The, you, there's a link on my Facebook page. You can get the tickets at Brown Paper Tickets for New York, Philadelphia, Seattle, and Denver. Uh, and again, I took a leap on Denver because you people were you were very vocal and you were very, very adamant about me coming. So good, I'm coming. Let's make sure it wasn't a goddamn mistake. <laughs> Uh, and again, that's on me. Again, I realize I'm not popular enough to be selling out these cities or selling these tickets and things like that. I understand. But if you people say that you want me to come, I will come. And then we've got to do everything we can to try to sell the tickets. Denver's going to be an experiment because I'm going to, I'm going to really try to get in the papers and maybe get on, on radio, do whatever I can to, to kind of push it. The woman who runs the theater is, she was immediately full of ideas and had like five things that I should do. You need to put it on this listing and go to the chamber of commerce. And I'm like, I told her, I go, I don't think my show's a chamber of commerce show. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> And uh, I told her, I go, real, it's a lot of raw language shows, almost two hours. And she goes, I have a show now. And it's something, it's like something about Satan fingering Jesus. I mean, it's like some weird, 
I don't know what the fuck the production is, but she's like, so believe me, it's called the Dangerous Theater. People know what they're getting into. And I'm like, okay, well, that, I mean, now, now it makes me worried. Now did I, <laughs> am I going to get shivved when I'm on stage? Is that what you're saying? Is that what's going to happen? I have no idea. Uh, but so, you know, go to Facebook.com, become my friend, become the friend of Lily Von Stupp, beca- become the friend of David Hernandez, who does all the music and the commercials and stuff like that, and the artwork for all the shows. And uh, and as I said, find all of the Bring Mike Schmidt 2 pages. You could be next. I mean, I'm, you know, there are other cities that are going to happen, definitely, and there are other cities that unfortunately probably look like they're not going to happen. Uh, but, you know, I took a leap on Denver, Seattle, Philadelphia, New York. This is going to be great. I love performing live, so hopefully you guys will buy tickets to come and see me do so. Uh, remember, you can go to MikeSchmidtComedy.com. And go to the Joe Business page. There, you can purchase download sets of the past shows. You can buy year one, year two, and year three individually. Or you can buy them all together in the Lord of the Schmidt set, uh, which is, of course, the uh, the Fellowship of the Schmidt, the Return of the Schmidt, and uh, the uh, the Two Schmidts, Two Schmitties. So go ahead and pick that up. That'd be great. We'd appreciate it. Uh, also, you can go ahead and visit the Zazzle store for mouse pads and mugs. And uh, remember, the tweakedaudio.com slash 40 always uh, supports the show. You can make donations to the show. And right now, in July, there's a promotion with tweakedaudio.com. First of all, if you want to just go to tweakedaudio.com slash 40 and buy earbuds or buy uh, cock ring watches, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, but if you make a donation to the show, I'll tell you, on the, uh, on the Mike Schmidt webpage, on, on MikeSchmidtComedy.com, in the upper left-hand corner of every page, there's a little Schmitty. Click on it. You can make a one-time donation to the show, or you can subscribe to the show and go $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month. I can tell you that for the month of July, if you make a one-time donation for $20, you will get a free cock ring watch from uh, TweakedAudio.com slash 40. If you donate $40, you will get a free set of earbuds from tweakedaudio.com slash 40. And if you donate $50 or up, you get the anti-premature ejaculation kit, the cock ring watch, and the earbuds from tweakedaudio.com slash 40. So that's 20, 40, and 50 as far as donations. Uh, we appreciate everybody who donates to the show. And uh, please remember that if you want your full name on the show, you can go ahead and let me know when you make your donation. Someone like Anthony Parker. Who donated to the show? Anthony Parker, actually, he started the Bring Mike to Melbourne, Australia page, uh, which is never, ever going to happen. But uh, I'm glad Anthony Parker wanted me to come to Melbourne. I would love to come. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't know what it's going to be like to fly out there and perform for Anthony Parker, an Aborigine and a kangaroo. I don't know how that's going to work. That's not going to go well. So uh, who cares? In the future, maybe it'll happen. But Anthony Parker donated to the show, and I appreciate that, Anthony. Michael Hines wanted his full name on the show. And I will say, I don't want to say exactly what Michael donated, but I will tell you that it ended in 01. There was a penny involved for some reason. <laughs> Michael Hines, I, I think he thinks I'm the price is right. And he was <laughs> trying to outbid people, and he did. He bid an extra penny. Uh, so good for Michael Hines. Thank you so much. And also Tim Q., and Sabrina V, thank you so much for donating to the show. That's Tim Q and Sabrina V, along with Michael Hines and Anthony Parker, donating to the show. Remember that there's the deal with tweakedaudio.com right now. If you make a donation, you will go ahead and win. We all will win. And uh, right now, I'm going to head home and try to win a hotel room on Priceline.com. Because <laughs> I, I do not have a place to stay in Seattle just yet. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, at least the weather's going to be better up there. It's like 70 degrees, which is fine. So I could sleep on the street, I suppose. Uh Although I was thinking, I'm like, well, maybe I could just crash at the theater. And it's like, no, they have another, there's a band after me. So it's not like I could get a nap while the band is fucking playing. I don't know what the fuck to do. I, I really, I'll, I'll go to Priceline and dick around and Lily's telling me, she's like, Seattle's like the unfriendliest city. And she's like, she tells me it's, it costs so much money. And, uh, I, I'm, you know what? I'm finding out that that's probably true. I, I, as I go ahead, the airfare was crazy and the fucking hotels and all this. Shit. Lily said their state motto was like, fuck you, pay our rates. And, uh. <laughs> And I'm finding that, look, if even William Shatner can't find me a deal, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Because, dude, I got a room in San Diego for 40 bucks, like a nice room downtown and other places. I went ahead and, uh, you know, Austin, it was a little, you know, they were higher, but certainly not what, see, I've, I've gone over what I've bid anywhere else and Seattle's just like, fuck you. Like, and not even giving me that weird price line option of, you know, if you just go $5 higher, we can find something for you. No, they're just like, nah, fuck you. So uh, I am not looking forward to that game tonight because normally it was fun. It was like the prize line can be fun when you put it in and it wins. You ah, I won. Awesome. I won it for what I wanted. Yay. Uh, but I'm not winning, man. I'm getting bent over by goddamn Seattle. This is fucking brutal. No one likes that. I can't like that Seattle. This whole thing has been a whiff. I'm not going to lie.
I am just stupid enough to think that when people listen to me and they listen to the show, they should take my honesty and go, oh, wow, how refreshing his, his unvarnished honesty is. And uh, the fact that he's willing to have a scorched earth policy and have no friends or no fucking future is so refreshing and great. But then they'll say to me, hey, do you need somebody raped for the steak? I go, yes, I do. Done. They'll take care of it for me. Thanks, snake rape. Oh, no one listens to show, bro? Wonder why? Wonder why no one listens to show, bro? I don't want to listen to show, bro. Please. Do it! Do it! Do it! Do it! Do it!